Hi everybody, we are on week five of our Lenten journey. I'm going to start things off right away with Ray, if you want to proclaim the gospel and your thoughts. Go ahead. Thank you, Father. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to Nicodemus, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him might have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe has already been condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the verdict, that the light came into the world, but people preferred darkness to light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come toward the light so that his works might not be exposed. But whoever lives the truth comes to the light so that his works may be clearly seen as done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Jesus. Lord Jesus Christ. You've probably seen this graphic before. Depending on how you look at this combination of letters, one of two phrases will stand out. In times of distress, despair, or unbelief, our first glance can easily read, God is nowhere. That may be how it felt for the ancient Jews in the first reading as their temple and their world came crashing down and they were carried off to Babylon in chains. But in moments of deliverance, exhilaration, or faith, we might instead see God is now here. If we're honest, we may even see both phrases at different times. The letters will not have changed, nor the reality behind them. The only thing that will have changed is us. Perhaps that's how the Jews felt when 70 years later, they suddenly were free to return to Jerusalem and rebuild God's temple. It can be shocking to discover that different people can sometimes see the same thing so very differently. In 1961, Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first man to orbit the Earth. After Gagarin returned to Earth, avowed atheist Nikita Khrushchev defiantly declared that upon reaching the heavens, Gagarin had said, I looked and looked, but I did not see God. Some years later, astronaut John Glenn, the first American to orbit the Earth, offered a very different perspective. Glenn told reporters, to look out at this kind of creation and not believe in God is to me impossible. It just strengthens my faith. Writing in 1963 of Khrushchev's boast that there is no God in heaven, noted Christian author C.S. Lewis offered his rebuttal in an essay entitled, The Seeing Eye. Lewis wrote, looking for God or heaven by exploring space is like reading or seeing all Shakespeare's plays in the hope that you will find Shakespeare. Shakespeare is in one sense present at every moment in every play, but he is never present in the same way as Falstaff or Lady Macbeth. To some, God is everywhere, to others, nowhere. Much depends on the seeing eye. Now consider a corollary question. How would Macbeth or Hamlet or any of Shakespeare's beloved characters gain any knowledge of their author? The only way that they could know anything about their creator would be for Shakespeare to write himself into their story, to live among them, and to relate with them as a fellow character. But isn't that precisely what God did for us? The author of all so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, 
but might have eternal life. God literally wrote himself into our story. In Jesus, we can see and know that God is now here. When he came to see the incarnation in this light, the previously unbelieving Lewis, as he put it, finally gave in and admitted that God was God. Declaring himself the most reluctant convert in all England, Lewis humbly submitted to the divine humility revealed in the incarnation. Hamlet finally met his author. From the perspective of faith, the incarnation is the consummate demonstration of divine humility and love, which enables us to draw close to our creator. But for those whose outlook in life is darkened or hardened by patterns of sin and disbelief, the incarnation can also be seen as a fairy tale, or worse, as a nihilistic tragedy leading them to recoil from wanting to have anything to do with thoughts of God. In the end, there are only these two ways of seeing. Either we love who we see and we run toward him, or we disdain what we see and we walk away. Whichever path we take is what John's gospel calls our verdict. In other words, God's humility descends so deep that rather than coming into the world to judge or condemn us, God submits himself to our judgment. Can the depth to which Almighty God will go for the love of his errant children get any more upside down than that? <clears throat> As a matter of fact, yes, it can. In the gospel, Jesus tells Nicodemus that the Son of Man must be lifted up just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert. Jesus is referring to an event recorded in the book of Numbers. The Israelites were tired and cranky after 40 years of desert wandering, and again they grumbled against God. So God sent a swarm of poisonous snakes to afflict them. Many died. The people begged Moses to plead for them with God. God then told Moses to make a bronze snake and mount it up on a pole. Anyone who looked at the bronze snake would be saved. Why a snake? And why this seeming violation of the law against making graven images? The latter may be a foreshadowing of God in Christ coming in the image of a man, but a snake? Even in numbers, the snake was an agent of punishment before it was an icon of salvation. And no biblical reference to snakes can ignore the serpent in the garden who was the first cause of sin and death. To assume the image of a snake, therefore, was for Jesus to say that he would save us by becoming sin itself, becoming our sin lifted up on the cross so that he would die instead of us. All we have to do is to turn away from the sin slithering in the dirt at our feet, gaze up at Jesus, and see that God is now here. To paraphrase C.S. Lewis, Everything depends on our seeing eye. Wow. Thank you, Ray. You uh, really covered the gamut there, everything from astronauts to uh, C.S. Lewis to um, the humility of the Incarnation and, and Shakespeare in between, and let's throw in the snakes, too. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the road to faith, really, I got out of that is is how you look at things. Mm -hmm. And maybe that in itself is an act of faith. Um, but the, the humility of the incarnation is uh, what is unique to the Christian faith. And um, John, in John's gospel, they spell it out so beautifully well. What I'd like to do today, uh, folks, is just start things out with a a story, actually, or almost a random story, and I'm going to take you back to it was the summer of 1936, said to be the, the hot, one of the hottest summers on record. And uh, an 18 year old Bob White Sr., my dad, <laughs> had hitchhiked to Missouri to take a job pounding spikes for the railroad. And it, at, at about that time, the great migration of of uh, people from Oklahoma, Okies they were called, to uh, the promised land of California 
inspired the epic uh, novel by John Steinbeck, Grapes of Wrath. And of course, my dad was experiencing his own grapes, Grapes of Wrath, trying to survive the blistering uh, heat of Missouri summers and uh, I guess, as he tells me, sleeping on top of railroad cars at night to stay cool and all of that. And he recounts the first day on the job, you know, an exhausted crew after working hard all day sat down under the, the shade of a tree and beers were passed around and about that time, uh, a town local who is known for being a bit of a bully, uh, especially to the new guys like my dad, challenged my dad to a wrestling match. <laughs> and of course, if you know, kid, he's got no choice, okay, they go at it. The crew continues drinking their beer and egging him on and um, to the surprise of er everyone, including my dad, the, the match ended in a draw. And um, that uh, town bully never hassled my dad again for that summer and all went well for the summer. Coming back to school in the fall, my dad recounts he somehow felt different. He couldn't explain it, but others noticed it. And maybe it was because he had learned how to believe in himself. Now we're going to wind the clock, the clock ahead uh, 30 years mm -hmm. to summer in 1966. And Bob White Jr., that's me, uh, had just reported his first day on the job working for construction, uh, Watson Construction. And the work crew boss, known to be hard on the new guys, particularly if they're college kids like myself, comes up to me and said, and says, uh, you're the, you're the new guy, right? And I go, yep. He throws me a shovel and he points over to the, this building. I see kind of a half a ditch. He says, start digging. And it was then that I, it occurred to me that he is testing me to see if I have what it takes to, to uh, keep this job. So I'd start digging fast and furious. And, um, you know, I wanted the job, of course, but this one was for pride. So I went at it all day long digging this ditch and it uh, wasn't as hot as Missouri but pretty close to it and at the end of the day he comes back and you know I've been digging all day and there's this ditch all around and you know I asked him how where over there how deep I uh, said just start digging and he looked irritated at that point so I started digging I dig, dug all day and he just looked over there and he looked turns to me goes see you tomorrow I went, Phew. <laughs> and uh, that work crew boss never hassled me the rest of the summer, and all went well. And going back to school, like my dad, somehow I felt different. Um, couldn't explain it, but others noticed it, and maybe it was because I was, in a, in a deeper way, learning to believe in myself in a way I hadn't done before. So learning to believe in ourselves, you know, it's, it's uh, kind of the key piece in the puzzle if we're going to develop into the fully alive persons that God created us to be. But the paradox is that we come to believe, truly believe in ourselves only when, like the 12 steppers say, we learn to surrender our life, our will, over to a higher, a greater power than our own. And as Christian believers, we know that higher power as a loving God revealed in, to us through his son, Jesus the Christ. And of course, in the gospel today, we're, we're talking about Nicodemus Nicodemus had no problem believing in himself. He was well respected as one of the leading Pharisees of his day and all of that. Uh, that is until the day he heard Jesus speak, preach. And that's when that element of doubt entered in because 
something in his heart he knew that he couldn't find the answers the way he thought he once could. All the answers that he had, he, he couldn't find them, and, and it was different. And so it was with that, that Nicodemus, under the cover of night, seeks out Jesus. And this man whom uh, he is um, great admiration of, and this man who he was so intrigued by and also frightened by, but he goes anyway. And uh, something told him that this man, Jesus, could offer his life the meaning and the purpose he was looking for. So that's how it happened. Um, seeing Jesus that night after, sometime after he gradually comes to believe in Jesus. And then he realized that Jesus was the one who could show him the way to the life he was looking for but could, could not find on his own. And so that is the, informa the uh, invitation Jesus offers to, to everyone, showing us the way to the life we're looking for but we cannot find on our own. And so God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever might believe in him may not perish, but may find life eternal. So that's a little bit about John's gospel for this, um, fifth, uh, this uh, fifth session we have. As always, Ray, thank you, and thanks everyone for listening in. Um, go at it now with your discussion. Good luck on that. Pondering your prompts can help. Looking forward to seeing you for our final session next week, our sixth session. Thanks. God bless. Be well.